overall, I would recommend considering using Riverpod. But generally speaking, um, there are a few flaws with provider, I would say, a few limitations. It's not able to solve more complex problems. It's a good time to uh, start picking up Riverpod if you want to, because um, since this month, effectively, we have the new documentation available. And yeah, today I have here a special guest with me, Remy. So he is known for being the creator of Vida and also now Riverpod. It's great to have you here, Remy. I'm happy to be here. And we want to like look more closer at why to use Riverpod instead of Provider, for example. The main question probably like for you, Remy, is um, what is the difference between provider or river pod on the documentation of river pod there is um a few pages um explaining how river pod differentiate from provider and how you can maybe uh, migrate from provider to river pod if you wanted to so feel free to look at it it's yes quite recent. You are talking about this page here i guess right river pod versus provider. yes there are actually a set of three pages like one of one with motivation quick start and fighter versus river pod but yes Pretty much. But yeah, overall, I would recommend considering using Riverpod if you can. I understand why some people want to stick with Provider. Uh, that's fine if you maybe have an existing project and you don't want to spend too much time migrating, or maybe you're used to it and you don't see a reason why you would switch. That's all right. But generally speaking, um, there are a few flaws with Provider, I would say, a few limitations. Like it provides basics for uh, exposing an object to your uh, with a tree and listening to that object. It's not able to solve more complex program uh, problems like maybe auto refresh, um, handling typical network requests like with catching errors, loading states. Um, maybe you want to combine two different states into a third state, or maybe uh, um, whenever a state change, you want to update another state. Uh, stuff like those. Maybe you want to listen to a state to show a, mo a model or a snack bar when some value changes. Many of those typical minor uh, issues, but that are when, when you add them all, when you all add them up, it starts to make, uh, to make a, a lot of small inconveni in inconveniences with provider. Riverpod kind of, um, kind of is another attempt at solving the problem. It uses a relatively similar pattern in a way. It's or it was originally designed as a major version of provider. It's just I, I figured I would make a separate package just to avoid breaking people. So you can now do pull to refresh, uh, infinite scrolling lists, stuff like those much more easily. Yeah, maybe we can start with like a quick demo. You can go through the documentation and can show us like what kind of things Riverpod offers and where maybe to start if you have never used before Riverpod. Yeah, so um, it's a good start. It's a good time to uh, start picking up Riverpod if you want to, because um, since this month, effectively, we have the new documentation available. So all this other, all the things we see here are new pages. We still have access to the old pages here, like the flag as old here but technically everything you see here is new content and so yeah you, you can see again why you would want to use Riverpod. maybe a quick start with maybe a dark pad or using zap on how to make a to-do list with a Riverpod, so you could go through it so uh, for a quick demo um, I would um, suggest going through maybe the two or maybe three first few pages of the essentials category mm -hmm. as they cover basic usage on on what you would generally need in a typical application. Basically, what what you should know is that RubyPod is is trying to focus around network requests because generally speaking, that's what you'll need to do the most in your typical applications. RubyPod is not tied to network requests, so you can do something other than network requests with it. Uh, it's just um, documentation center around it because you will do that 90% of the time, effectively. So here in this page here, we basically want to make um, simple applications, which just read only. Uh, we make a bunch of get requests to uh, maybe obtain maybe a, a set of data from somewhere on maybe um, an open API, like um, weather API, or here, I believe in this example, I use the board API, which generates gen random activity su suggestions to people. So yeah, so when you want to use Riverpod, the first thing you have to do is you have to set up what we call a provider scope. Basically, when you call run app in your main, the very first widget you have to insert is 
provider scope. It basically enables Riverpod in your entire application. And you should put it inside run app in not, and you should not put this widget inside uh, my app so that so that uh, tests are able to maybe over change the behavior, but that's more advanced. advanced. So yeah, now that we set up provider scope, um, Riverpod should be installed on, in our application. And so we can start maybe defining network requests. For this here in this section, we explain uh, that we'll define a network request maybe and re render it in our UI. So the first step is to make a model representing what we want to show in our application. Here, since I'm using the port API, which is this one, which you can click on it. I don't think it, if I open it, I don't think you'll see it because I'm just sharing my window, but basically this board API, when you call the get endpoint, it will return a JSON object with a random suggestion of an activity you could do if you're bored, like maybe uh, go buy some lunch or something like that. And so um, we could define a class which represents a typical suge suggested activity. So we have a few properties in here, like the activity, the potential category, uh, like maybe uh, if it's um, maybe going to the restaurant or um, or if you want to learn something, that's a different category. The number of people required for this uh, for this activity, like if you want to do to play a board game, you have multiple people. The potential price necessary, uh, where, even if it's zero and run uh, an ID unique to this activity. Uh, of course, at every point, um, you can toggle the code generation uh, toggle in the documentation, which basically transform all the snippets uh, to use code generations instead, because Riverpod is kind of recommending code generation nowadays. So you'll see it, you'll see it using a bunch of places. But yeah, again, uh, you can you can use it without. Right, so we've defined a model. Um, then the next step is to define what we call a provider. A provider um, is um, a cached function which you will then be able to access inside widgets to obtain the result and listen to that result if it somehow changes. Um, and so those cache functions um, are defined uh, kind of like in an unusual, unusual way, um, basically you define a global variable and you wrap your function inside a, an object called provider. So here's a, a legend of all the possible uh, options here. Um, I won't go through, through them all individually, but a typical example would be if you want to do a network request, you want to use a future provider. And so you define um, a variable representing whatever kind of object you want to expose. So maybe an activity provider, which is a type future provider because network requests are asynchronous. So we want to use a future provider. And then in here, we can do our get request. We use the board API. We point to the endpoint necessary. Then we decode the JSON object and we transform the JSON into our previously defined class here. This is your typical from JSON object. Uh, again, if you use code generation, the syntax is relatively similar. Um, when you do so, uh, it's much more obvious that uh, when we define a provider, we are actually just defining a function because um, here we just see a normal Dart function with just an annotation. So now that we've defined a provider, uh, the next step uh, is to um, listen to that provider inside the UI. So we can create a typical widget. Uh, and in here, we can uh, insert the consumer widget, which is a builder, which gives us a ref object. And that ref object is able to listen to providers. So we can do ref.watch dot provider, the provider we defined before, so activity provider. And this syntax should be familiar to you if you've used provider before. It's like effectively the same thing as context.watch, but instead of passing a generic type, you pass the variable you defined before. 
And then you obtain here a nascing value of activity because um, the request is asynchronous. And so uh, we obtain information about whether the request is loading or maybe in error state. And so you can react in the UI on, on this state. It's effectively the same thing as async snapshot from Stream Builder. And so the last step from here is to maybe use uh, pattern matching from Dart 3 to uh, switch over the different possible states. Uh, like maybe do we have data? If so, we show the data. Otherwise, if there is an error, uh, we show uh, an error message. Otherwise, we're in loading state and therefore we show a spinner. Um, so yeah, that should be... Um, Typical simple get request um, so far. I'm not sure if it's worth it to go further right now. Uh, we can also like have in between some questions, first of all, from the community and see what they um, ask. Um, there's one question, wait. Um, is it easy to adopt from to Riverport after learning provider or is it like difficult? I guess it depends on how far you want to go. You should be able to pick it up fairly quickly to maybe if you want to use um, chance not if your provider or state not if your provider, whatever you were using in provider before. Uh, they are also available in Riverpod, so um, you could effectively use the same uh, way of writing your application with Riverpod without actually changing you the way you build applications, but just changing package. But then um, as you use it more, uh, you realize that um, the new features of Riverpod enable um, significant simplifications of logics, of your business logic. And therefore, uh, you might want to start uh, trying new things, maybe refactor different uh, previous code uh, or use different approaches to simplify the logic. But uh, at the same time, since it's using a different pattern, obviously there is a new learning curve here because it's not something you used in, in the regular provider package. So it kind of depends on, you can you can get started quickly and then over time you can learn more. Yes. Okay. I think, yeah, we can go on with the second document. The second one is how to, um, once we've done a get request, we generally want to um, to do updates. Because like maybe if you obtain the list of to-dos from your application, uh, from your server, you want to maybe add or remove a to-do or maybe complete it. Because like if we reuse the syntax we saw previously, uh, whether we use continuation or not, um, we define a provider and then we do the request, whatever that is, uh, an HTTP get, and then we decode it and return a bunch of to-dos. Here it's just simplified. Um, but here with this syntax right now, we don't have a way to add to-dos. Um, and so uh, if you want to, if you want to enable your UI to modify this state, you have to use a class instead of just a function. So the, the syntax is slightly different. Here, for example, when using code generation, instead of annotating a function, we annotate a class which we generally call notifiers. And so basically, uh, when you use a class, um, whatever is seen here in your function, you would move it inside uh, a method named build. So you would copy paste this in here. And then uh, if you just add no no nothing besides just the build method, uh, the class with just a build method would be strictly equivalent to just having the function. You can view the function as syntax trigger for just having a single build method. Uh, but, once, but once you have a class, you can add um, different methods in here. And those methods would be available for widgets to invoke when you want to update your state. So again, I won't necessarily read every single line of code here, but an example would be uh, first, if we want to migrate um, the previous function here to the class, we have this. And then we can, we can start adding methods on here, like maybe an add to do method. And this add to do would maybe do a pass request um, to submit a to do. You encode it into JSON and whatever. Um, and then 
uh, your UI is now able to invoke this method using the previous ref object that we saw using ref dot read. We pass the to do provider, um, which is uh, the one we saw here, like to do list provider. We have it here. Where are we? To do list provider. And then we pass dot notifier because we want to obtain the class instance so that we can call the add to do method. And so when we call dot notifier, we obtain this, the instance of this object. So we can just directly invoke this. Uh, and so when we do this, this will perform our pass request. Uh, but the thing is, in this pass request here, we haven't yet updated the state. We just made a pass request, but our UI doesn't currently reflect the change. And so to um, reflect changes, there are three main ways to do it generally, because it depends on your backend, pretty much. Because say, it depends on if you're maybe using like web sockets, or maybe if you're using, um, uh, I forgot the word, um, it's a typical schema for uh, backends where when you do a post request, the post request returns the new state of the application after that post request. Um, so like for example, the first way to, the first approach in this documentation uh, showcase how to, um, in the scenario where the, the server returns the new state. And so we can see here, we obtain the response from the post request and we decode the body and then we uh, save the body into the state by calling state equal whatever. Um, then uh, our UI will, will automatically uh, show the new state. But again, uh, you can look at the other approaches. If, if maybe your backend doesn't return the new state, you can use maybe invalidate self. Uh, basically what this does is um, after your post request has completed, you can call invalidate self and it will re-execute the, um, the get request. So you will refresh the uh, current state or maybe you can update the state by hand by calling state equal and retake the list yourself. There are a few options. I would suggest going through the documentation because it explains the pros and cons of each approaches. Like maybe you want to be more efficient in terms of resources. Maybe you don't want to do a network, an extra network request, or maybe you want to get the most up-to-date state. Um, so it's interesting to see the different possibilities. Um, and then if you look at the, um, at this documentation, it also explains a more interactive example on how to do maybe a showing the progress of the current operation. Like you see here, when, when we press the add to do button, it shows a spinner and maybe an error if there's an error. Uh, yeah, I guess that's it for this page. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think we, we used like here different things like ref and read and ref mm -hmm. and what. Can you maybe like explain what is the difference when to use ref read, when to use ref watch? Basically, um, it depends on where you are when you try to read a, a provider. Like if you're inside a widget, uh, in the, uh, if you're inside the logic that renders UI, like maybe um, w while the build method is executing and maybe you're, and you're trying to build some taxes or maybe um, containers, whatever. Uh, then in this case, you want to reuse uh, ref.watch. Whereas if, you're, um, if your code is executing after um, the UI has built, like maybe if you're inside a click on layer, like a, on pressed on a button, or maybe, uh, maybe you're uh, on a um, form submit, uh, whatever that is, um, something that is that generally reacts to user interaction or maybe uh, a state change, uh, typically a callback. Um, then you use read instead. Um, is that generally easy to use cases? It's worth noting that um, Riverpad comes with a custom link rules and there are link rules in progress to warn you if you're using the wrong one. So 
what is the moment you have to learn about it. Um, chances are in a few weeks, maybe um, you wouldn't even have to care about it because the linter would tell you you use the wrong one and you should you should use the other one instead. Um, we can also look at another question. Should we use like code generation with Riverpod? Because right now the documentation tells about both, right? About um, code generation and no code generation. Um, what is the difference and what do you prefer to use? Yes. Uh, so for code generation, uh, again, the documentation covers this. Now you can click on the question mark right next to the code generation toggle. It will open the about code generation page. Uh, it explains the reasoning why it exists, uh, what it adds to Riverpod. Um, effectively, um, Riverpod was kind of always built in with code generation in mind. Uh, the thing is, I've refrained from uh, pushing it from the start, mainly because um, it's always been controversial, controversial code generation. But the thing is, um, there is a um, language feature called um, macros, which is basically about code generation built in the language, which is in progress, which hopefully should come in a few, uh, within a few years, I hope. And so um, I figured um, to avoid people having to migrate their code uh, once macros are available, because once macros are available, we would obviously use code generation because at this point there would be no downside to not using code, uh, to, to using code generation. Um, then in that case, um, Riverpod exposed a way to use code generation today using Build Runner, uh, even though it's slower and some people may dislike it. So this, so basically, uh, you have two choices. Um, whether if you dislike code generation and you absolutely don't want to use it, it's fine, just don't use it. Um, that's why all documentations showcase how to you, how to do it without conversion and with conversion. Um, so you're free to not use conversion at the moment. Everything is supported so far. At the same time, if you don't mind conversion, I would suggest using it because it's slightly more future proof and you would get um, sneak peeks at um, 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 what you, what you could say, uh, improvements. Like for example, when you use code generation, you have hot reload by that. I mean, uh, if you update the code in a provider, like, um, if I go on a random provider, is there one in this page? Yeah. Say here, there is a provider defined with code generation. Say I update this function to return something other than this current string. Um, if we were not using code generation, we would have to do a hot restart to have the new uh, behavior in the, in the application. Um, whereas if you use code generation, whenever you change the source of a provider, the UI automatically recomputes the provider and shows the new result immediately. At the same time, all the providers which were, which were not modified uh, pre keep your previous state so you don't restart the entire application whenever you modify something. So that's one benefit. There are a few other benefits like maybe DevTools will be better. Some features will be specific to code generation. Uh, so there are benefits to using it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, I think we can go over some questions. How do I handle multiple state in a state notifier or should I create one state notifier for each state? Yeah, I guess that's kind of two different topics, but at the same time, uh, the answer to this question is the same no matter no matter which type of object you use. Uh, pretty much, uh, again, if we look at the code, uh, like if I come back to the maybe the first network request page, mm -hmm. When we defined an activity here, uh, it already has a bunch of properties in here. And so it's not like we only store an integer, we store a complex object with multiple different properties. And so you could have a very complex object with a lot of sub properties, like maybe instead of a string, you could have another complex object with another set of properties. So you basically, when you use a state provider or maybe the new notif here, which we'll see in a, in a second. Um, you just make a class representing the state you want to have, and you add different properties in here, and and yeah, 
with maybe that's where code generation is often recommended because one of the one of the things Riverbot promotes a bit is using immutable state. And when you use immutable state, you want to clone an object. Uh, but if you want to clone an object, typically you'll need something called uh, a copy with method. Uh, but you have to type it by hand if you're not using code generation, which is a bit tedious. Whereas if you use code generation, you can use something like freezed, for example, or maybe uh, built value, whatever, which already comes with a way to just clone an object. Uh, but yeah, but overall, um, about the question of uh, change notifier versus um, state notifier versus notifier, uh, the answer is um, you can use change notifier or state notifier mainly for migrating from existing code bases. Like say you have an existing code base with um, provider, um, the provider package, and you're already using change notifier in a bunch of places. Uh, I would suggest that if you want to migrate to Riverpod, uh, to first stick to change notifiers on those cases because you don't want to rewrite your entire application. So just maybe change the provider and use change notifier for those. But for any new logic, I would recommend using the notifier object, which is the syntax we saw here when we define a class. Uh, like if I don't use code generation, we see. Um, we see I define a class extends some notifier. Uh, we, we use this thing pretty much. Um, that's the most up to date approach. Um, it's more tailored for Riverpod, whereas state notifier and change notifier are kind of like separate tools. They live on their own and therefore they are, they are, uh, they are less integrated with a Riverpod, whereas here you get more benefits when you use this one. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, maybe let's look at some more questions. Yeah, is it a good practice to declare a controller, I mean, scroll controller, text editing controller in a Riverport class? I would generally say no, you likely shouldn't do this, mainly because um, those objects are um, typically tied to the widget tree and uh, you likely often don't want to share them between, uh, between routes either. Because like this scroll controller, for example, contains the current scroll offset, and so you wouldn't want two different routes to use the same scroll controller. Uh, you would likely want that when you press the back button, it reuses the previous scroll controller instead of sharing it between pages, so that the scroll offset is restored. So I would consider, I would suggest either using uh, plain stateful widgets for those. Or uh, again, in the documentation, you can see the second toggle, which is Flutter hooks, uh, which is an optional package. Uh, it's different from Riverpod. It has pretty much nothing to do with it, but it's often combined with it. So that's why documentation talks about it. Uh, basically, it's a different syntax on stateful widgets, which makes using, which makes creating scroll controllers uh, way simpler uh, for it all. So again, you can check this checkbox if you want, and you'll see um, you'll see what it does, like use an image controller, for example. Uh, although I would say uh, if you're brand new to Riverpod, I would suggest not using it, uh, mainly because hooks add their own uh, layer of uh, learning curve, and you likely want to just start learning Riverpod first, maybe get you, get familiar with it. And then maybe in the future, if you want to get fancy, you can try it. So that's why if you go to the documentation, it's disabled by default, but you can opt in if you want. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Let's look at some other questions. Does a provider work only if it is being watched in the widget or can a provider also be watched by another provider? Uh, yes. Uh, providers can watch all the providers. Uh, let me check if I have an example for it. Uh, I think so. Yes. In this page. Uh, again, the combining request page shows various ways you can combine providers. For example, we, we can reuse this raft of watch methods. Like say you define a stream somewhere or a future. You can call raft of watch inside a provider using this ref object passed to providers. And so whenever this object updates, and then this provider will re-execute with the new state. 
meaning like meaning you basically up, get the most up to date state naturally without without doing anything. At the same time, um, Rootopod offers different ways to combine states. Like for example, another approach, which is something we don't have in provider the provider package, is the listen approach. Basically, you take a provider and you get a callback, which is which is invoked whenever the state changes. So you can do maybe you like show a snack bar, something like that. Uh, again, the read method, which we saw previously. Um, so yeah, providers can watch other providers. Yes. Okay. All right. Then let's look at some other questions. Yeah, I think we also might want to know the opinion about. Um, many people ask like should what should we like use block or river pod and i think there were some people also mentioning get x so what is your opinion about the other state managements compared to river pod i mean obviously i'm based uh, you can't expect yes. me to say use block of course i will say use river pod yes uh, um for me, Riverpod kind of solves a problem which I don't see all the packages uh, attempting to solve. Um, there are a few, there are actually a few atoms, sorry, but uh, they are more, they are way less popular. There are so few uh, with maybe like 10 stars on GitHub. Um, and using, and, and, they, and they still have some downsides in my opinion, like maybe they are using untyped APIs. But basically, um, one of the cool thing with the way Rootpad promotes um, logic in your application, uh, it, it makes it declarative. It basically makes you write code for your business logic like you would do with uh, writing UI in your widgets. You make it, you, you make a build method, and you um, and your build method updates automatically whenever something changes. You, you don't have to maybe um, react to a mutation, and when there is a mutation update, uh, update you have to update clone the state yourself. Generally, you can just use ref.watch from provider, and most of the logic will be done for you. Um, um, of course, that might be a bit abstract for you at the moment, um, which is why I would likely suggest trying it out a, few t uh, a bit and see the differences. Um, I mean, we have talked right now how to use RiverPod, but is there any best architecture that you have maybe an example app that they can look at? And um... Yeah, there are a few example apps in the official examples category. Maybe you can maybe even look at the third-party examples, which is basically examples from contributors. Uh, I don't necessarily know if they follow good practices because I don't necessarily look at every single example. But um, if you want to see how I do something, you, you look at the official examples. If you want to see what people use Rufbot for, you can look at the third party examples. You'll see a lot of possibilities here. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Okay, all right. I think now we have. Uh basically talked in detail about river pods and yeah thank you very much for being here